everyone loves a good FEA model and everyone hates those hand calculations. I'll think about those old school engineers. Back of the hand calculations. However, hand comps teach you intuition. They can also fundamentally unlock problems which are missed in those FEAs. This breaks down some of the key aspects that where hand comps can actually beat FEA. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Not only do hand comps give you a better intuition about how buildings behave. So when you're looking at your FEA model going, hmm, something fundamentally wrong here, you can also do things up to multiple times faster as you can use those rules of thumb and get you 90% of the way there and then only fine tuning it from that point or fundamentally finding flaws in your FEA model. For example, if we're looking at load paths and how systems transfer, looking at a compliant system where we've got a force transferring from one area to the other, you can see it's got a fundamental bending action in the system. The FEA model is not showing the same moments. And you're looking at it going, hmm, I trust that FEA. It must be the same results. However, there's a sneaky nature of where forces are going. So what do we have here? We have two plates, top and bottom. They can transfer the load quite easily. And we've got a force coming from the left-hand side. So if we're looking at the flexure force, you're going, ah, oh, okay, we're fine. The plates take the flexure, we back calculate, we've got quite a high moment. But there's one key aspect that we're missing here, and that is the shear force. The shear force is the vertical transfer of load from the left to the right, as not only do you have bending, but you also have shear to get to the final position. How does it transfer the shear here? You've only got two plates. We've effectively got a Virendil truss. So we need to look at how's that moving and where the forces are going. And we can see a simple back calculation. We can have a look at how we break this down in a simple form. We've got a moment with two fixed ends. So how do I fundamentally look at how those loads are transferring? It's very much similar to how you can look at a fixed base connection. You've got a differential movement on one side. That means that there is a moment there that needs to transfer. So those plates need to transfer it in flexor. But it's not just any flexor. It's not just straight flexor, so which would just be P times L. Very easy, you can back calculate that and get a moment. However, this system's actually stiffer as potentially the movement while moving vertically. It's not actually rotating, it's keeping it vertical. And so you see your plates are forming an S shape effectively. So that means the moment on the left needs to sum up to the total moment. So effectively, whatever moment you're reducing on the other side, you reduce the moment on the other side. So you're potentially leading to an increase of force transfer through the left to the right. So when we back calculate it, we can see that we're at moment on peak moment on the left and a peak moment on the right as well, which are almost equally imbalanced. And how you look at it, you can either look at a two fixed support, which is typically, you know, your PL on eight, you're moving the force across and you can see you've got significantly reduced demand of bending moment that you need to deal with. So instead of just P times L, you've got P times L divided by two when you rework the formulas. But that FEA wasn't fundamentally showing that movement. You see in the first case, I overestimated the design by just doing P times L. The moment is substantially bigger. I'm going, what's wrong with my FEA? Surely my hand comp is correct. So when we're looking at FEAs, we can go up to four to five times faster with our calculations. We can also break down whether the FEA has failed or not. Let's break down this simple aspect and how the loads transfer through this simple structure. We have two plates and we have some stiffening joints at given centers. So we've got some ways that we need to transfer moment and shear. When you look at the FEA, the moment forces aren't too bad and they sort of align with my hand calculation. You got the push-pull nature of the system. So we're not too bad at that point, but we're looking at the moments, the vertical load. Where is it going? Let's think about it. We have a plate with a stiffening point here, like a Virendil truss. It's moving down. Maybe it's just a pure cantilever of a system. So we've got a cantilever here. So it's just PL times two. So whatever the shear distance is away, we can calculate what the moment is induced at this point. So we've got a big moment, but we're not actually seeing that in behavior. Maybe I need to drill back down on the FEA. We look back at the FEA. It's not doing that same movement that I'm expecting. We just look at the model. We've seen that we've over stiffened the system. You see the stiff system is too stiff. So it's not bending as expected. It's more of a curvature. That means the top and bottom action is taking that shear force not as expected. We change the fundamental properties of the system from a block to a plate. And now look at what's happening. We're getting a differential nature of the system. So we're getting this differential S bend into the system more like what we're expecting. But now the forces are still substantially less than what I was calculating before, the P times L. So what could be fundamentally wrong here? Let's break it down a little bit more. Look at the shape. The shape is fundamentally telling us where the problem is, that S bend. So it means it's looking like there's a moment on both sides. When you think about a very moment shape, it's got a fixed continuity through this. It means you've got a fixed and a fixed position. Now, if we're looking at equilibrium, we know the moment has to equal the same on the left 
has on the right. So it's just depending on how much stiffness we have on both sides. Very much like when we look at fixed position. So what is typically PL on four becomes substantially less to PL on eight as you balance the load at the top and balance the load at the bottom. So we've effectively halved the moment in a simple supported system. The same thing is happening there, but how do we break it down? Well, what we can do is rework the formula, just prove it that we're going to the same aspect. So if we look at the same nature of that simply supported, but just look to the left. We look at the shear force that is going to the left and assume that is P. Now what moments they get in? And through back working the calculations, you can see that the actual nature of that, provided you've got full fixity on both sides, is that PL on two. So because the system drags down, behaving in a very similar way to what our model is with. So by looking at those simple calculations, we can back work out what the shear force should be there. So it means that when we're getting there, instead of PL on four, which have severely limited our forces, we can double the nature that our moment takes, meaning that we can get PL on two, substantially more shear force through this junction. And you can see here, just through some simple knowledge of how the system behaves, we picked up that there was an error in the FEA. We then did an error in our hand comps, which means that the FEA is now behaving correctly, but our hand comp is now wrong. And through iterating back and seeing how the behavior is working and adjusting our hand calculations, we can get substantially closer to the FEA results. So when we're doing FEA compared to hand comps, it's all about the different assumptions we had. Originally the assumptions in the FEA were incorrect, allowing for the system to be too stiff. Then the assumptions in our hand comp were incorrect, meaning the system was taking a lot more moment than was what actually expected. Then when we both iterated back, it's about how the two systems are behaving together to get us back to the correct result. And through iterating through this process of looking at the FEA, looking back at the hand comp and looking back at the FEA and then back at the hand comp again, we're iterating back until we're getting to a closer so it's not about a matter of which one's correct and which one's not. It's about looking at both of them to get to the correct answer. Fundamentally, if you can't break it down to that simple format, you shouldn't be in FEA because you don't know the, how the structure is fundamentally behaving and you're just assuming the FEA results are correct, which is a fundamental catastrophic problem in many different situations, such as the Hilton walkway collapse, which was a simple FEA calculation that everyone just looked at it and said it should be fine. However, there was a fundamental change on site that means the behavior was actually fundamentally different than what was in the FEA model, leading to a catastrophic failure. A canopy collapse in a snow-driven area. See, the FEA came back and there was a lot of talk back and forwards with the engineer on this canopy. The engineer just went, yeah, my FEA is correct. It's produced the right results. I think you're just worrying about something that's not actually real. But when they came back and looked after it later, after the catastrophic nature and the failure had actually occurred, they found out they made a fundamental misunderstanding of the assumptions. And FEA can also fundamentally hide how things are actually working through either having things connected that shouldn't have been, not allowing for the right movement, or not allowing for a non-linear behavior that should have occurred earlier. All these aspects in the FEA calculations can fundamentally hide behavior through having incorrect assumptions. When we do a hand calculation, we have to make assumptions. And when we do FEA, we're all about making simple assumptions so that we can get to our results. Those assumptions can sometimes fundamentally create a problem. So the FEA in the first case, we're just smearing and hiding interactions in between it. The hand calculations made a very conservative assumption, meaning the forces were predicted to be substantially higher. So you need to work out how you can do both and get to the answer quickly. And most of the time, you don't even need that FEA as you're not really saving that much if saving anything at all. So for example, if you've got a cleat plate connection with four bolts, there's a lot of other checks that you need to do. You may put the bearing stress on there, but are you looking at what the tearing forces are through that plate when you're looking at the bolted connection? Are you looking at the bearing action? Do you actually have a non-linear model? Are you looking for the twisting effects that may actually occur on the system? And in the first place, if you're just doing a simple bolted connection, why are you throwing it in FEA in the first place when you can have a once-off calculation that means that you can repeatedly use it over time? So you can use a program like MathJot to put in those simple rules of thumb, those simple calculations that you can reuse over time. Even though you're jumping into the FEA and thinking it's going to be faster, by having a reusable calculation, you can actually be quicker and make those assumptions in real time in a faster result. And with some rules of thumb, you can make sure that you potentially even design something faster than someone can actually model it in FEA. So we can have a battle off one time. So if anyone wants a challenge, we can go through, I'll do my hand comps in MathJot, someone else does their analysis in FEA and see how fast we can get to the correct result or how much difference we actually are. If you did enjoy this video about breaking down FEA and how you can do it faster with hand calculation, you will enjoy this video about the fundamentals of FEA that everyone should know, especially if you're jumping into such a complex software. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do that. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. And I hope you keep learning and I hope to see you next time.